The parable of the wedding feast is my favorite parable that Jesus gave. It's really unique because while it tells what the kingdom of God is like, it also describes in part what the kingdom of God actually is. Most parables are stories used to convey meaning through comparison or analogy, but this particular parable is more than that. The imagery used here accurately describes the Christian enterprise in terms that I believe carry significance both now and in the age to come. In Luke's account, before the parable was told, a man sitting with Jesus remarked, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And this is really similar to the phrase that we see the angel speak to John in the book of Revelation. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And we know this is going to happen. So while the kingdom of God may be compared to a king who put on a wedding feast for his son, it's also what God is actually doing. He really is the king. He really has a son there will really be a wedding feast at the end of the age. And we really have been commissioned to invite men and women to be reconciled to him and join him in his heavenly feast. We really are servants sent by the master. Listen to what Paul says. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. So if you are a Christian, you are a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God, a steward of the good news. And so as servants, it's required of us that we be found faithful with what we've been entrusted. As we explore this parable, I've layered together excerpts from both Luke's and Matthew's account to emphasize certain points that especially inspire action. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. Luke says that they began to make excuses for why they wouldn't come. Notice that the servants are sent to inform those who were invited that the wedding feast has been prepared, everything's ready. All they have to do is show up. But when they began to deem themselves unworthy by making excuses, the Lord sent his servants out again to invite others to the wedding feast. So the servants came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. It reveals to us the Lord's urgency for lost souls. Go quickly. As many as you find, invite to the wedding feast. The Lord has urgency because he wants his house to be filled with those whom he has given the right to become children of God. And he wants us to go gather them. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servants, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. The role of the servants is simply to obey the command of the master. And we've been told not only, not merely to invite people to the wedding feast, but to compel them to come in. As servants of Jesus, we have a responsibility to the lost to invite them, to appeal to them, to implore them, to compel them to come in, to reason with them, explain to them, let God prove himself to them, to warn them. It's no passive endeavor. Obedience to the master requires action. And Matthew goes on to say, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. The great thing about the guests is that they're not merely attendees or observers. They are future members of the body of Christ who the servants are going out to gather to worship with forever. And we know from Revelation chapter 7 that this is going to take place. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, 
Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The master sent his servants to the highways and hedges, to the farthest places. And so we know from Revelation 7, there's going to be people from every language, tribe, and nation. And we know that the master sends his servants out to the farthest places. So we should consider in our day, where might these highways and hedges be? Where are the farthest places that still have not been told that there's a wedding feast in the age to come? Where are these people who have still not been told that God crucified his son 2,000 years ago for them? We need to find those people and prioritize them. And here's a really interesting part. The master sent his servants to invite poor and lame and blind people to the wedding. And as we'll read in a minute, he becomes angry with them when they don't bring the proper wedding attire. But why? How can he be mad at a homeless person for not having a tuxedo? But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him out into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There are serious consequences for showing up without the proper wedding garments. And these aren't just merely clothes we're talking about. This is the free gift of righteousness of Christ that we read about in Isaiah. The master is right to be angry with the guests for coming without the proper wedding attire because he's personally handing out free garments of salvation at the door. Nobody gets in apart from Christ's righteousness. He makes that clear to the Pharisees that they don't get in on their own righteousness. They can only get in if they've been clothed in the garments of salvation from Jesus, that's a free gift. Jesus gave this parable to the Pharisees as a rebuke for rejecting him as Messiah. He tells them, I'm going to take the kingdom of God away from you Pharisees and give it to a people producing its fruit. So they understood that this this parable was given as a correction to them. And so it's important for us reading it that we need to see the context that Jesus gave the parable in. But I think it's helpful and does no harm to consider also the the comparison between the imagery used here and what God's actually doing in our day to bring salvation to the lost. Let's allow the imagery used here to help us understand the simplicity of our role as servants and the urgent nature of the task we've been given and the joy of bringing people to God so that his house may be filled with guests. As servants, Whatever our perceived personal callings may be, we first have a call to make disciples, a call to help announce the good news of God, a call to compel.